so today we're going to be talking about the role that eunuchs plays throughout Chinese history. Uh, after all, they were often placed in positions where they could exert considerable influence over the imperial family and were responsible for some pivotal moments throughout China's history. This might seem slightly backwards, but first I want to go through the historical timeline of when eunuchs first started to really appear and gain prominence in China and what their function was throughout various different dynasties. So that'll be the first half, the less sort of gnarly half. Uh, then in the second half, so after our break, I want to talk more about why people chose to become eunuchs, how they went about becoming eunuchs and why being a eunuch was particularly important. Uh, so if you are of a sensitive disposition, it's the second half that you have to watch out for. Uh, as I said, I'm going to be as euphemistic as possible but there are just some things that you really it's very difficult to to not just say outright and sometimes the euphemisms sound worse uh now this image here is of the historian Sima Qian although again to why he's important for our story in a moment uh, the information surrounding when this practice of uh, eunuchs in China began is really unclear but there are historical chronicles that state several Chinese kings began keeping emasculated servants sometime during the 8th century BC the only concrete evidence we have, however, takes us back to the Qin and the Han dynasties. Now, as I mentioned uh, briefly, if you came to the seminar on slavery and human sacrifice in China, another one of my favorite ones, but a very dark topic, uh, the Qin dynasty court, so the first sort of uh, dynasty in China, the one that unified China, they would castrate men as a form of punishment and effectively turn them into eunuch slaves. These eunuch slaves were mainly forced to do physical labor on civil projects such as the terracotta army is one of the greatest examples but also the original great wall before it was uh, recovered in gray brick during the Ming dynasty uh, in a society where family meant everything castration was arguably a much crueler punishment than death as it prevented the man from ever having more children and disconnected them from their family completely this trend of castrating men as punishment for certain offenses continued into the Han dynasty in fact, it was during this time that the great historian Sima Qian, who you can see here, was actually castrated as punishment for political dissent. This famous event happened in 99 BC when he spoke out in defense of military, a military general named Li Ling after he was blamed for an unsuccessful campaign against the Xiongnu tribes. The emperor gave Sima Qian the choice of being executed or being castrated, and he chose the latter so that he could finish the great historical work that had originally been envisaged by his father, Sima Tan. After being imprisoned for three years, he was released in 96 BC, and it was expected that he would commit suicide because uh, it was customary for a gentleman scholar that had suffered such a disgrace as being castrated. Instead, he decided to live on within the imperial courts as a palace eunuch and ended up completing his magnum opus in the process. His records of the Grand Historian now rank as arguably the most important historical work in Chinese history. So it's really a good decision. Uh, it's good, good for us, really, that he made the choice that he did. It seems, however, that these pal uh, palace eunuchs would prove to be the Han court's downfall as well. This came in the form of what are known as the Ten Attendants, or if you're learning Chinese, the Shi Chang Shi. Um, the problem sort of began in the 150s AD, we're talking, during the reign of Emperor Huan, when two palace eunuchs named Zhang Rang and Zhao Zhong began to exert considerable influence over the imperial court. In 159 AD, Zhao Zhong participated in a coup against a high-ranking military general named Liang Ji, who had begun to monopolize state power. His coup was successful, and Zhao Zhong was able to oust him from power, which granted him the recognition and favour of Emperor Huan. He was made a Marquis of a chief district, and in 165 he was promoted to a secondary Marquis, so he starts moving up through the ranks in the imperial court. During the reign of the succeeding Emperor Ling, so from 168 to 189, both Zhao Zhong and Zhang Rang rose to the position of what's known as a Zhong Chang Shi, or Central Regular Attendant which would be a title they shared with all of the other eunuchs in question eventually, hence why they're referred to as the Ten Attendants. Uh, contrary to what the name suggests, however, there are actually 12 eunuchs that came under the banner of the Ten Attendants, although Zhao Zhong and Zhang Rang are the two that are singled out as essentially the ringleaders of the group. Under their sway were 10 other eunuchs belonging to what are known as the Zhong Chang Shi rank, uh, who were known as Xia Yun, Guo Sheng, Sun Jiang, Bilan, Li Song, Duang Wei, Gao Wang, Zhang Gong, Han Kui, and Song Dian. These eunuchs were not alone, however, as many of their relatives and associates were also embroiled in the corruption at court. Uh, to give you just sort of one example of their nefarious deeds, I want to talk about an official named Jiang Jun. 
So when this thing called the Yellow Turban Rebellion started, it's one of the worst rebellions that happened during the Han Dynasty, started in 184, Zhang Jun wrote a formal a form of official communication to the emperor known as a memorial, where he outlined why he felt the ten attendants and their corruption and the corruption they fostered within the court was what led to the rebellion in the first place. He thus urged Emperor Ling to execute the ten attendants at once, otherwise they might lead to the destruction of the Han Empire. Uh, Emperor Ling decided, sort of misguidedly, to show this memorial to the eunuchs in question first, who all promptly removed their hats and shoes, knelt before the emperor and begged him to imprison them, stating that he could take all of their worldly wealth away to fund the army and help stop the rebellion. The emperor ordered them to get up off the floor and sort of put their clothes back on, uh, since he believed in their sort of outlandish display of loyalty to the empire. He even went so far as to chide Jiang Jun for ever having doubted them. Later on, Emperor Ling ordered the Minister of Justice and the Imperial Secretaries to investigate Jiang Jun and his Taiping sect, which had been responsible for the Yellow Turban Rebellion. Sorry, Jiang Jue and uh, the Taiping sect. Jiang Rang and his attendants bribed the investigators into framing Jiang Jun for secretly engaging with the Taiping sect, something he never did, and he was subsequently imprisoned, tortured, and eventually he died in prison. In fact, it turns out that the ten attendants, they were the ones who were secretly collaborating with Jiang Jue, and they were nearly caught when two other eunuchs, known as Feng Xu and Xu Feng, believe it or not, uh, were embroiled in a scandal and then executed straight afterwards. It seems Jiang Jue hadn't been far off the mark either, as it was the actions of the ten attendants that largely led to the downfall of the Han dynasty. Uh, now, this image here is taken from an illustrated copy of The Romance of the Three Kingdoms, one of the great classics, the four great classics of Chinese literature. And it shows the military general He Jin plotting to kill the ten attendants. You see, after Emperor, Emperor Ling passed away, his 13-year-old son, Liu Bian, became the emperor and was attended by Empress Dowager He and the chief general-in-chief He Jin, the Empress Dowager's brother. Emperor Ling, however, had secretly chosen his eight-year-old son, Liu Xie, to be his heir and had entrusted this knowledge to the eunuch Jian Shuo. This, of course, led to a tense power struggle, with Jian Shuo attempting to enlist the help of the ten attendants because they were so powerful at court by this point. The ten attendants ultimately, of course, betrayed Jian Shuo, who was executed in the summer of 189, but by the autumn of 189, He Jin had begun to recognise them as a considerable threat. There was much scheming that kind of went on at court, something that is often the subject of uh, Chinese period dramas, uh, with the eunuchs bribing the Empress Dowager's mother into defending them, so the Empress Dowager He categorically refused to believe her own brother He Jin and take on his proposal that they execute all of the ten attendants and rid themselves of the incessant corruption at court. With the help of another military general named Yuan Shao, He Jin thus hatched a plan. He secretly instructed a series of provincial military officials or warlords, who were known as Dong Zhuo, Wang Kuang, Chao Mao, and Ding Yuan, to lead their troops to the imperial capital and demand that the eunuchs be executed, which he hoped would pressure the Empress Dowager into just agreeing to it, capitulating. When Dong Zhuo's forces approached Luoyang, Empress Dowager He ordered the eunuchs to leave the palace, but their pleading led her to relent and she brought them back inside. Having saved their skin once again, the eunuchs, of course, began plotting to assassinate her brother, He Jin. On September 22nd, 189, they issued a fake imperial order for He Jin to enter the palace and meet his sister, Empress Dowager He. Uh, he then entered the palace unarmed, thinking he was meeting his own sister. Without his usual attendance, he was then ambushed by the eunuchs in question, who stabbed him to death themselves. This, of course, outraged He Jin's military and political allies, who stormed the palace and killed anyone who looked even vaguely like a eunuch, so a really bad day at the palace for anyone who hadn't grown facial hair. Uh, in fact, according to historical records, young men working in the palace who didn't have facial hair at the time dropped their trousers in a desperate attempt to prove that they were not eunuchs so they wouldn't get killed. Uh, in the ensuing chaos, over 2,000 people were killed at court, and Dong Zhuo, one of the military warlords, seized power in the process. Now, this famously led to the fall of the Han Dynasty, the catastrophic fall, which leads to the beginning of the story, Romance of the uh, Three Kingdoms. Um, bear in mind, the Han Dynasty was the first golden age in Chinese history, and it led into a fractious era known as the Three Kingdoms period, one of the bloodiest periods in Chinese history, but heavily romanticized, of course, in the Romance of the Three Kingdoms, as the name uh, would suggest. 
Now, this image here is a mural taken from the tomb of Prince Zhang Kuai, which depicts palace eunuchs and dates back to 706 AD. You see, in spite of what had happened during the Han Dynasty, the allure of keeping eunuchs at court proved to be too much. In particular, young boys from the indigenous tribes of southern China became a popular choice for palace eunuchs during the Sui Dynasty and the Tang Dynasty. I'll explain precisely why court eunuchs were so integral to the court in a moment after the break, but for now I'd like to talk a little bit about one of the most famous court eunuchs to have ever emerged during the Tang Dynasty. As we discussed before in our class, if you came to the seminar that was specifically on the Tang Dynasty and kind of gave an overview, from 755 to 763, the Tang Dynasty was beset by a disaster, a horrific disaster, in the form of the An Lushan Rebellion, uh, which was led by a military general named An Lushan. Uh, now, An Lushan was a really interesting character. He was of Sogdian and Gokturk origin, so he wasn't Han Chinese. But he rose through the ranks and gained the favour of Emperor Xuanzong thanks to his prowess as a military strategist. This was what eventually allowed him to amass power in northeast China and then led to his coup against Emperor Xuanzong, which eventually led to the rebellion. Uh, what you may not know about An Lushan, however, and what makes him truly fascinating, was that he was horrifically, horrifically obese because he had a congenital defect. Uh, so much so that his sheer weight supposedly once crushed a horse to death when he tried to climb on top of it to ride somewhere. Uh, apparently it didn't get there very fast. Uh, he also suffered from chronic eye problems, which eventually led to him going blind, and a skin disease that led to him developing ulcers all over his body. So he needed a considerable amount of help from his attendants. To this end, he took on a eunuch of Khitan descent named Li Chu Ar, who was a teenager when he began working for An Lushan. Now, An Lushan reputedly used his own sword to perform the operation on Li Chu Ar, and understandably, he botched it. So Li Zhuar lost a ton of blood and nearly died in the process. Not really a great start to this business relationship. Uh, fortunately, An Lushan managed to save him by smearing ash on his wound. Try not to think about that. Uh, and from then on, he became An Lushan's most trusted servant. Along with two other men, it was Li Zhuar who was largely responsible for helping to dress and undress the chronically obese An Lushan. And he would also help lower him, his naked body, in and out of the steam baths at the Huaqing Springs. So as you can imagine, he wasn't his number one fan. In later years, however, An Lushan's eye problems led to him becoming blind, which in turn made him paranoid and ill-tempered. He would regularly take out his temper on his servants by beating them, or sometimes even just having them put to death if they displeased him. Li Zhuar was said to bear the brunt of An Lushan's rage on multiple occasions, being beaten by him on a regular basis. Thus, you can understand why when An Lushan's son An Qing Xu approached Li Zhuar and proposed a plot to assassinate An Lushan, Li Zhuar was kind of more than willing to go along with it. Uh, on the night of January 29th, 757, Li Zhuar snuck into the palace with a sword and attacked An Lushan while he was sleeping. An Lushan did try to fight back, but couldn't find the sword that he typically kept under his bed. The next morning, An Xin Chu took power from his father, became the head of the rebellion, and announced that his father had died. So as you can see from these stories, palace eunuchs occupied a relatively controversial place throughout Chinese history. It was during the Ming Dynasty, however, that they ultimately rose to the peak of their power. Uh, now, after the break, I'll talk a bit more about where eunuchs kind of came from, why they chose the profession, how they got into the profession in the first place, and the means of being castrated, which were all largely standardized during the Ming Dynasty, so during the 14th century. For now, however, I'm just going to give a general overview of what was going on during the Ming Dynasty from the perspective of the palace eunuchs. Generally speaking, eunuchs in Ming China were acquired via three different means. Some of them were foreigners who belonged to an ethnic group that had been at war with or had rebelled against the imperial court, so they were captured by the Ming Dynasty army and castrated as punishment. For example, when the Ming Dynasty was at war with the Mongolians during the reign of the Yongle Emperor and the population of Mongolian, uh, the population of Mongolian eunuchs in Nanjing, the imperial capital at the time, therefore increased exponentially. If you've ever heard of the famous Chinese mariner and explorer Zheng He, you may also be surprised to find out that this is how he rose to power. He belonged to a Muslim family living in Yunnan province, but was captured by the Ming army in 1381. He was then forcibly castrated and made to work as a palace eunuch. He was sent to serve under Zhu Di, the prince of Yen, and gained his confidence there, which served him well when Zhu Di rose to become the Yongle emperor. Some foreign eunuchs, however, were given as tribute from smaller vassal countries and kingdoms, so they were not taken forcibly, sort of the second mean. 
For example, from 1368 until 1435, a total of 198 eunuchs were sent as tribute from Korea to Ming Dynasty China. Alongside these foreign eunuchs, you of course also had indigenous Han Chinese eunuchs, who either chose the profession for themselves or had been encouraged to pursue it at a young age by their families, or kind of forced into it by their families. It wasn't only the royal family who hired these eunuchs either. They were often hired by elite officials to serve their families, so the demand for eunuchs during this time was surprisingly high. At its height, there are around 100,000 eunuchs living in China, but this number dropped to around 70,000 towards the end of the Ming Dynasty. Now, one of the reasons why the eunuchs were so unique within the royal palace is that they occupied a kind of liminal space between the most powerful and the most lowly members of the palace. For instance, they would sometimes form alliances with those of other low-ranking occupations, such as serving women, but they also had access to members of the royal family as well. In particular, since they were eunuchs, they could gain private access to female members of the royal family, which was not possible for male officials, so they had access to this sort of nexus of power that no other sort of male member of the imperial court had access to except the emperor. Throughout the dynasty itself, their role within the court changed and expanded. The Hongwu Emperor, the first emperor of the Ming Dynasty, decreed that there should be a limited number of eunuchs within the imperial palace, and that they should have reduced literacy to prevent them from accruing too much power. So he was kind of on the right track. As time went on, however, the Ming emperors found it useful to educate certain eunuchs so they could serve as their personal secretaries, kind of like a PA. This allowed certain eunuchs, such as Liu Jin, pictured here, to rise to power yet again. The Yongle Emperor even went so far as to create what's known as the Eastern Depot, incredibly famous in Chinese history, which was a system of eunuchs that served as spies and secret police within the imperial court. Again, great for period dramas. Uh, they would listen in on conversations, observe certain interactions at court, and then report back to the emperor. In 1477, the Chunghua Emperor started another organization called the Western Depot, which was similarly manned by eunuchs and was actually designed primarily to hunt out witches, so people who practiced any kind of like dark art or magic. The Eastern Depot lasted until the end of the Ming Dynasty, while its counterpart and kind of rival, the Western Depot, only survived until 1510. There weren't that many witches to hunt out, apparently. Uh, for this reason, eunuchs in Ming China developed the reputation for having eyes and ears everywhere which made a lot of people understandably kind of uneasy around them. Based partly on fear and partly on truth, scholar officials would thus often portray eunuchs as greedy, cunning and duplicitous in their political and literary writings. This sense of distrust and hatred was easily harboured by the common people, since eunuchs had deliberately chosen to break one of the most important tenets of Confucianism, to keep your body whole. By allowing a part of their body to be removed and a very important part of their body, which was a gift from their parents, they had violated the terms of filial piety and denied their family the possibility of a male heir to carry on the family name. Although their reputation was much maligned, not all eunuchs were involved in court politics or thirsty for political power. For example, throughout the Ming Dynasty, court eunuchs began to take the place of female palace musicians and became some of the greatest musicians to have ever been produced by the court. Now, before I speak about the role of eunuchs in the Qing dynasty, however, I want to uh, spare a moment to talk about arguably the most famous eunuch in Chinese history, or maybe the most nefarious, infamous eunuch in Chinese history. Uh, although Sima Qian and Zheng He are arguably more famous in their own right for their own pursuits, it is Wei Zhongxian who tends to rank as the most powerful and infamous eunuch in Chinese history. Now, very little is known about Wei before he came to court, but what may surprise you is that he was illiterate throughout his entire life, which may indicate that he was either born into a peasant or a merchant family. It is estimated that he was born in 1568 and was even married before choosing to castrate himself at the age of 21, possibly to escape significant gambling debts that he had accrued at the time. These records of his gambling habit, however, aren't terribly reliable, as they come long after he became known for his misdeeds. So as I said earlier, scholar officials were very keen to kind of malign these people, people's reputations, so it could all just be uh, rumours. Thanks to familial connections, he was able to work in the Forbidden City, and gradually courted favour with several palace officials. In 1605, he was given the job of serving meals to Lady Wang and her son Zhu Youxiao, who would go on to become the Qianxi Emperor. During this time, Zhu Youxiao, Wei Zhongxian, and Zhu's wet nurse, Madame Ke, all became very, very close, with Zhu Youxiao even going on in later life to treat the pair like they were his parents after his mother died unexpectedly in 1619. 
as you can probably guess, this represented a significant pathway to power. In 1620, in a really bizarre twist of fate, both the Wanli Emperor and his heir, the Taichang Emperor, died unexpectedly, which led to a succession crisis. Lady Li, the Emperor's favourite consort, kept a close eye on Zhu Youxiao, with the hope of taking over as regent when he took power. These plans were foiled by a group of scholarly activists known as the Donglin faction, who invaded the palace, captured Zhu Youxiao, and forced him to declare himself Emperor. With Lady Li out of the picture and their pseudo son installed as the emperor at the age of just 15, this left Wei Zhongshen and Madame Ke in a considerably influential position. This was coupled with the fact that Zhu Yaoshao, who is now the Tianqi emperor, was uninterested in court matters and often allowed Wei to take care of them for him. By 1625, Wei had risen to become the minister of the Eastern Depot, that sort of system of eunuch spies that I mentioned earlier, and he thus ended up with a legion of 1,000 informants at his disposal. From then onwards, his power only grew and grew, to the point where imperial edicts would be issued in both the emperor's name and in his name, under the title of Depot Minister, which is insane when you think about it. Uh, Wei took advantage of the situation by bestowing official or military titles on 14 of his relatives. Uh, out of sheer fear of his power, local officials even began building temples in Wei Zhongxian's honour. As you may have guessed, the scholars who had helped install the Tianqi Emperor on the throne were less than pleased with the situation. It kind of backfired on them. In 1622, one such scholar named Zhou, Zhong, uh, Zhou Zongjian attempted to impeach Wei and begged the emperor to have him removed from the palace. In 1624, he even went so far as to write a formal memorial to the Tianqi Emperor, listing what are known as Wei's 24 crimes, some of which were fabricated. Uh, both attempts to have him deposed were unsuccessful, but it also put the Donglin faction on Wei's hit list, and that's why this is so important. Although as Minister of the Eastern Depot, Wei only had the power to arrest and convict dissidents from the peasant and merchant class, it was his ability to influence imperial edicts through the emperor himself that proved to be his greatest asset in this instance. From 1625 to 1626, 13 key Dongling scholars were either were killed and hundreds of others were either demoted or purged from the imperial court as a result of these edicts. It seems that at this point, Wei was virtually unstoppable. In 1627, however, tragedy struck for Wei when the Tianqi emperor, of course, died. None of his sons had lived to adulthood, so his younger brother, Zhu Youjian, was installed on the throne as the Chongzhen emperor. Wei attempted to resign at this point, possibly in an effort to save his skin, but the Chongzhen Emperor refused his request. After a few months, he finally heeded the advice of his officials and called for evidence of Wei's crime. It was said that more than 100 officials sent memorials directly to the Emperor, denouncing Wei for various reasons. Uh, the Chongzhen Emperor initially exiled Wei to Fengyang, which is in modern-day Anhui province, but one of his commissioners warned that Wei might use his contacts to then stage a rebellion, so he promptly summoned Wei back to court, and you know what that means. On December 13th of the same year, Wei was informed that he was to be arrested and ended up committing suicide in an inn south of Beijing. His crimes were considered so numerous and his potential allies so dangerous that the Chongzhen Emperor even had his body dismembered and put on display in his native village, as a warning to the public. Uh, the number of court eunuchs drastically decreased during the Qing dynasty. So this is when the Manchu people took over China. There's a big sort of cultural shift. Uh, as many of their tasks were placed under a new institution that was known as the Imperial Household Department. By the beginning of the 20th century, only about 2,000 eunuchs were working within the Forbidden City. In the photo here, you can see some of these eunuchs carrying the Empress Dowager Cixi's sedan. So you can see the Empress Dowager just here, and then these are all palace eunuchs. Towards the end of the dynasty, they became notorious for their corruption and their thievery, stealing as much as they possibly could from the palace while they had the chance. Although life in the palace afforded these eunuchs with comfort and the possibility to steal valuable items, it came with a huge downside. They were essentially the property of the emperor and could be treated however the emperor pleased. Emperor Pu Yi, the last emperor of China, if you've ever seen uh, the movie The Last Emperor, it's about him, recalled that at the age of 11, beating eunuchs was an integral part of his daily routine. He said that he had been encouraged to take out his bad tempers on the eunuchs by his other family members, uh, who simply had to bear the brunt of his assault without a word. Even after the revolution ended imperial rule in 1911, Emperor Puyi was allowed to continue living within the Forbidden City along with his palace eunuchs, receiving financial support from the new Chinese Republic right up until 1924. 
A turning point came in 1923, when Emperor Paul Yi believed the eunuchs had staged an arson in order to cover up thefts of various imperial treasures. So he had them all expelled from the Forbidden City, and palace eunuchs were doomed for, uh, forever to never grace the annals of Chinese history again. Uh, now, after the break, I'll talk a bit more about how and why people went about becoming eunuchs. But for now, let's have our break and a really terrible joke. I am so sorry, but I had to include it because I thought it was great. 